Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to each and every one of you. And of course, this is the deep dive into the secrets of the Reach in-game cinematic. Not the best way for you to watch the cinematic if you haven't already. Please click the link in the top right hand corner to watch my reaction to it. I think that's the best way to watch it. I lost my mind at certain uh, intervals of this cinematic. But this one is going to be the deep, deep dive. Not a good way to watch the cinematic because there's going to be a lot of pausing, a lot of chat, a lot of discussion. And of course, I'm human. I'm going to miss things. I'm going to forget things. So if there's anything that you've noticed in the cinematic that you go, Akalon, what are you doing, bro? You should have noticed that. Please do not hesitate to let me know in the comment section down below. And before we start, to all of the patrons and the YouTube members, thank you so much for all of your support. Your name's on the screen right now. I really appreciate you. And remember to slap a like on this video if you like in-game cinematics, you like the analysis, you like what I do on this channel. I would really appreciate it. With that said, let's jump into it. So first things first, I want to talk a little bit about the opening scene. This is what we're met with. Very beautiful, very vast, open, really showcasing what Dragonflight is all about. Even for someone that maybe accidentally got to the cinematic and don't have a clue what this is about, this is maybe a little bit uh, sort of advertising for what the game could be, but we are met with this beautiful vista, you know, waterfalls in the background, trees, platforms really gives you a sense of scale of what is going on here but i love the mistiness that is created here as well showcasing the storm that's hit the waking shores and of course that's been persisting throughout the waking shores making it impossible for the drakvir to return to their home uh, and you're gonna see that that is actually very purposefully done uh, as we get into the first few seconds of the cinematic The storm is receding. So, right off the bat, we're met with Sekereth and the Sundered Flames. They, of course, the Drakthir faction that didn't join us in the aspects in their fight against the Primal Incarnates. But what's interesting here is that they also didn't join the Incarnates. Sekereth and the Sundered Flame really doing their own thing, this expansion. They're looking for the power or the legacy of Nalfarian. They believe still that Nalfarian was hard done, that Nalfarian is their father, and that somehow they have a birthright to the powers of Nalfarian. So they, they really feel hurt. And we heard yesterday during the interview with Steve Denuser that in this expansion, they really wanted to highlight the duality of villains in this cinematic. And I think they do it so, so well. And if you really start thinking about it, Dragonflight really is the first expansion where we have quite a few enemy sources that do not necessarily work together. They're not necessarily on the same side. So let's start off with uh, probably the one that right now seems to be playing very much in the back, in the sort of back rows, and that would be the Twilight Dragons. We know we, we had a very short quest line where we saw the Twilight Dragons and they're very hellbent on bringing uh, forth Morazond within this expansion. But right now, you know, they're sort of on the back burner. They're not allied with the Primal Incarnates the, or any of the other enemies on Dragon Isles. They are their own thing and they want their own thing. Then, of course, we have the Primal Incarnates. They're sort of right now the main threat, wanting to undo everything that the Titans have. You have Sakurath and the Sundered Flame. They really just want the legacy that is Deathwing or Nalfarian at this point. It's not clear whether or not they're going to go down the same dark path as Nalfarian did, although there is a modicum of speculation that I can throw in here just very quickly. We know that Again, thanks to the interview, and this is going to be spoilers, so if you don't want this, just stick your fingers in your ears for a couple of seconds. But we know that the Crucible, the Shattered Crucible, Aberus, the raid, Sakurath is the one that sort of leads us through this raid. We're chasing him through the raid, and he goes about discovering the things that Nalfarian has been up to. And there's a very real possibility, because remember, Aberus, the, the Shattered Crucible, is where Nalfarian ultimately fell to the madness of the Whispers. So there's a very real chance that Zachareth and the Sundered Flame 
ends up succumbing to the exact same sort of madness within Avarice. So, you know, just going to throw that out there. And then you have the Jaredin, who right now they're seemingly kind of sort of uh, allied with the incarnates, but also not really. They, they want to kill the, t the aspects and then they want to kill the incarnates. So again, another source of enemy and another antagonist within the story but not quite, uh, you know, aligned with anything else. So there's really a lot of moving pieces on the board that is Dragonflight right now. Very cool. The opening line here gives us a moment in time for the cinematics. Akareth says here, uh, the storm is receding. This tells us this should have happened right after uh, Razageth's defeat. The final moments of her life sort of flickering away there. The reach is ours once again. I will highlight something very interesting about Zacharyth here. And if I'm butchering his name, I do apologize, but he doesn't have the eyes of a villain to me. When I look into his eyes, there's there's not hatred in his eyes. So it's not feel, you know, again, this is sort of a cinematic choice, a cinematography choice. Uh, oftentimes a story choice where villains will look like villains just to make sure that the audience understands this is villain you know this is not a good guy this is the guy that you should hate and if you think back in world of warcraft all villains have sort of looked like that whereas with sakurath his eyes are kind these are not the eyes of an angry person if you think about you know why he turned away and why he went his own way it was mainly confusion he didn't understand being woken up and realizing that Nalfarian is dead. They don't know what happened. They don't know the story of what happened. And they don't trust anyone but uh, Nalfarian. And so they're off now f trying to find their own way. But his eyes certainly don't scream villain yet. Take cover. So this, again, just highlights from a cinematography standpoint that sort of duality of enemies. They're hiding in the shadows, but it also gives us a power level comparison. The Drakthir instinctively understand they are not powerful enough to take on the Incarnates, but they're looking for that power. They know that Nalfarian must have left them some power. He was their father, after all. So they're looking for the power that will ultimately allow them to take their place as equals amongst the incarnates and the titans, uh, the aspects and all the rest of them. But right now, hiding in the shadows, just looking up at them and clearly not sure who they are. This is actually a very nice moment in the cinematic, just showcasing just how shielded the Drakthir were and how secret Nalfarian kept the Drakthir. Just listen to the conversation that happens here. Are they Sokoreth? Is it the aspects? They don't even know what the other aspects look like. Giving us a lot of insight into the secret keeping of Nalfarian. Just how many secrets Nalfarian actually kept. His own brothers and sisters were completely unknown to the Drakthir, or at least to the majority of the Drakthir. Sakurith, on the other hand, because he's been searching for information, for knowledge, he knows that, no, 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 these are Razageth's kin. This is not the Aspects. No. Razageth's kin. And here is where I lost my mind. When this camera pans round, this was just phenomenal. Hey, I, I tell you now, check out the reaction. But there was a very genuine, oh, shit, moment that happened uh, right at this moment. All right, so we've got to pause here for a minute because there's a lot to unpack here. The first thing that I want to sort of tackle is there's currently a rumor going around within the community that this is very reminiscent to a lot of people of the Eternal Ones. Now, I get where you guys are coming from 
you know, you look at at uh, you look at their forms and you you get this idea that hey, this like this looks very much Primus. Eridicron, for example, looks very much Primus infused. Veranoth, on the other hand, very Winter Queen vibes. I genuinely believe that this is purely by accident. There is a outlandish theory in here that would suggest that you know during one of the cycles where death was trying to make incursions into reality as we know that all of the cosmological forces are wont to do that death chose themselves some dragons some proto drakes to empower there is that outlandish theory although to me i think it, it is just coincidence i don't think that is what they ultimately went for it's far more just a case of they really do look like their elements. They, they really do resemble their uh, their elements, so to speak. I want to take a moment to discuss their visage forms, because this is something that I haven't seen a lot of people touch on. It's interesting that all other dragons, their visage form will be mortal-like. Even though they can choose any visage form they want, the primalists, on the other hand, choose visage forms that is humanoid but no no more mortal than anything else that you could find they distinctly choose not to present themselves as mortal and this to me showcases a pride that the primal incarnates have in being primal and being part of the elements they they want to keep that as part of their visage form they want to make sure that everyone that looks upon them understands who they are. And of course, also mortals, direct result of Titan and Old God influence, there definitely is that as well. But I love the fact that it does instill this. We are the primal incarnates. We are of the elements. We will not demean ourselves to, you know, really resemble mortals we are not mortals we are far above the mortals the last echoes of her storm are fading she is truly gone we i do have to say though fair enough to me and and this will showcase again in this uh cinematic Vernoth seems to be the one with the least amount of hatred iridocron filled with hatred varak I mean, come on. Like, this guy is just... He is the Joker at this point. He just wants to burn everything down. Watch the world burn. That's his devil may care kind of attitude towards everything. Veranoth, on the other hand, appears to be a lot more reserved. Her hatred seems to stem from a genuine place. Or at least her distrust of the aspect seemed to sort of originate from a genuine place and it might be a place where common ground can be found at least that's the idea that i'm getting from veranoth right now and there's a good chance that veranoth may not turn into the enemy or the ultimate enemy so to speak uh, and may actually become an ally at some point which would be very interesting getting a villain that actually switches sides when's the last time we've had that we should be devouring the murderers' hearts. Do not underestimate them, Farak. Our sisters overconfidence. Again, love the the display of superiority here. Veranoff and Farak follow Eredakron. He calls the shots. He is the most powerful so that hierarchy has already been set we already know that eridicron is going to be the real big bad and we know this because the aspects have told us this eridicron is the hardest for them to take down and also the last one that they imprisoned but just this small little scene really sets that stage for the audience to show that even though veranoth and farak also powerful not willing to take an eridicron and it it becomes even more clear just moments from here was her downfall while the aspect's power has waned their forces grow stronger and we must even the scales 
So I have to pause here because there's a lot of people that immediately pointed out, whoa, Akalon. Could this be the duality between light and void? So people, there's a meme going around right now that showcases Nalfarian as he fell to the old gods with Iridocron as he opens this pathway and people are saying this is the duality now we know that Iridocron struck deals we're told this by Nostormu and that it was terrible deals and they don't even think that his kin knew the deals that they had struck just another reason why I think Veronoth will ultimately turn against her own brothers uh, Veronoth doesn't know about the deals that Iridocron had struck and she does appear to be the most level-headed of the three so if she were to found out that Iridocron had struck terrible bargains with terrible powers she may indeed be willing to turn against them but anyways to the duality argument I see where you guys are going and I kind of like it as a guy that prides myself on crazy speculation I'm right there with you I think you're wrong for a number of reasons this is just what earth magic looks like the light signifies heat as earth magic is wont to do or to generate i don't think that there is any truth to eridicron striking a bargain with the light but then again we know the light strikes the light likes striking bargains and we also know that the void struck a bargain with nalfarian so it is entirely possible that the light decided to strike a bargain with Iridocron to even the scales, to even the odds, you know, not wanting the void to be the only one with a dragon. The light, you know, made quick work of getting the, a dragon of their own. Although I'm not entirely convinced that the light would do that. I don't know, but, you know, just wanted to make sure that I do speak to it because I know the people in the comment section are immediately going to go, whoa, bro. What about the light uh, influence there, right? They get so many secrets from us. That line I said yesterday during my reaction as well is incredibly impactful to me. And maybe it's just me. Maybe the rest of you are listening and saying, hang on, this doesn't matter. But to me, that line, they kept so many secrets from us and from each other what makes that line so impactful is the way in which she says it suggests a genuine betrayal she feels betrayed that they decided to keep secrets from them and what i don't understand there is that if you were adversaries or if you were sort of below the aspects we know the aspects were elevated to be the rulers of dragonkind if the primal incarnates were sort of lesser drakes or proto drakes at that point why would they ever expect the aspects to share any of their secrets the aspects are far more intelligent than the primal incarnates however the way she says it suggests that this is not wholly true the primal incarnates were not beneath the aspects it almost feels like they were equals at one point perhaps created to be equal now i will say we have tier's vaults and tier has two vaults one vault dedicated to the aspects another dedicated to proto drakes we know the titan keepers love their experiments so i shall throw out now what if the aspects were meant to be the embodiment of the cosmological higher magic so a step above and the primal incarnates were meant to be the ones governing the elements of azeroth if that makes sense so the titans created two bodies one body would govern the elements ensure that the elements never again fall to the influence of the old gods but also ensure that balance remains intact for the elements another body would ensure that the functions and systems of azeroth remains intact and in time the titan keepers started to favor the aspects far more than they favored 
the primal incarnates. Perhaps the primal incarnates were created even before the aspects, and the aspects were simply an upgrade. So the primal incarnates were cast aside, perhaps imprisoned for a time by Tyr and the Titan Keepers. I'm just sort of spitballing here. Obviously, I have no idea, but in my mind, that could definitely happen. And even from each other. I just, I love this moment. Uh, the, the, you know, the self-defense or the auto-defenses coming online. And it is just these massive earthen husks that just stand up out of the ground. It just looks so cool to me. I'm not sure why I like it so much, but I, I just love it. But again, you can see the light in the earthen magic. Remember, now Farian also earthen. And if you look at the, the, the color profile of this magic, you will find that it is exactly the same color profile as the color profile that Eridicron used earlier in the cinematic so if you look at that color profile you'll find that this is exactly the same color profile so there really is no reason for there to be any light influence in this it is the same very interesting thing here that fire the lava the molten you can see the moment where there's a surge of power as the molten touches for rock which is very interesting being able to power up just by touching molten lava uh, suggests perhaps future elements to his fight because you just know we're gonna fight this crazy bastard at some point but if you look at his reaction here, there's definitive power gain or at least a surge of something that goes through him as this magma molten lava flows over his hand. <laughs> And then, of course, just want to make sure, again, I told you, the cinematic will continuously highlight the power level differences between them. Farak and Veranoth both only fought one of the elements, or of the protectors, shall we say. Iridocron fights all of them and kills all of them at the same time. Now, you could argue, but Akalon, this is really not a fair fight. This is Eredokron's territory. He's fighting Earth and things. He is the primal incarnate of Earth. I imagine that this would be true no matter what enemies. Eredokron truly is being shown as hyper, hyper powerful. It is here. Neltherian's betrayal shattered their unity, left fissures in their hearts. There's now twice in the cinematic mention of heart. Farak says right in the beginning, we should be devouring their hearts. And now Eredokron mentions fissures in their hearts. I'm not saying I know right but i think it is interesting remember there are whispers uh specifically ilganoth's whispers her heart is a crater and we have filled it it's interesting to say the very least and i just caught that literally right now with all my preparations for this video i only literally just now while recording this realized whoa wait that's now twice that they've said hearts in the cinematic and in both times, it, it really was hyper-accentuated. So it must mean something. What I'm very, very interested in is how did Eridocron know these things? How was Eridocron involved in these secrets? Other, of course, than his connection to the Earth, 
which one could argue maybe gave him some insights into things that Nalfarian had done within the Earth. Uh, I, I still find it interesting that he would know any of this. And then we have this seal. A seal that we find with marks on the outside. Now, let me just see quickly here. In their hearts. So we have the runes on the outside. We have one, two, three, four, five. The five runes on the outside. We have what seems to be three runes on the inside. And when he picks it up, I believe there's another five runes that come out of this. Could these runes be reminiscent of the dragon aspects themselves? Five aspects, five runes. He speaks about the betrayal of Deathwing. Could this device be linked to that betrayal? Could this be what is missing from the aspect's power? Remember, the Aspects are now are struggling to get their Oath Stones to work. They're struggling to get their power restored. And at some point, Nalfarian managed to convince Maligos and the other Aspects to pour a portion of their power into the Dragon Soul. This would have left them particularly weakened. Not fully, they only depleted themselves in Cataclysm, but still... Could this be it? Could this be where that power now lies? And again, how did Ibritacron know about this? Yet the pain he inflicted was only the beginning. There we go. The runes once again coming out of this symbol, this emblem, whatever the hell this is, this device. It's interesting that Eridicron says the pain he inflicted is only the beginning. What else did Nalfarian have planned for the Aspects? What else did Nalfarian want to do? We know that Nalfarian was hellbent on undoing what the Titans had done. That would mean killing all of the Aspects. Is it possible that Nalfarian built a weapon that could do exactly that. A weapon that would instantly kill all of the aspects. We know that he liked his experiments, so I do think it is plausible. Avarice. His hidden laboratory. One last secret. It's three symbols. So we have five symbols on the outside. Three symbols around that thing, and when he picked it up, three new symbols i don't know what the symbols mean at the moment but it's the numbers must mean something five three and three because blizzard never does anything by accident if you have any thoughts on what this could mean let me know in the comment section down below please deep within the earth The location of Aberyst must lie within this vessel. Within this vessel, I've been thinking about this for a few hours now, and I don't understand what that means. The location of Aberyst must lie within this vessel. What vessel? Is she the vessel that she's referring to? Could it be that a portion of her memories were taken from her? This is possible they were imprisoned. And we know that this is what happened to the Drakthir. Nalfarian had the Drakthir's memories removed by Maligos. So it is possible that Veronoth has have been there before. She knows where it is because she's been there before, but those memories were removed from her. And that might be what she's referring to when she says this vessel. This, of course, brings in a whole new discussion. This vessel... A vessel would suggest that it is something that you were put in, not something that you are. Now, the other vessel that you could be speaking about is literally just the ring. So my job here is to highlight all the things that there could be. 
I have not decided yet. The most obvious answer is that it is just the ring, the, uh, the, the device that they found, and that's the vessel that she's referring to. Very interesting. Then, what is inside this vessel? Because a vessel is just something that carries something. So what is within that vessel? Becomes the very interesting discussion or, or the very interesting idea then. Um, but yeah, it could go anywhere right now. My most sort of straightforward idea here is that she is speaking about that device and that that's the vessel that she's referring to. But then that opens a whole bunch of new questions. But I just wanted to make sure that you guys know there is a duality to what this could mean. I will decipher its knowledge. <laughs> what use are Navarian's twisted experiments to us? The laboratory itself is... I just love Farak. He really is just one of those... I don't care about Nalfarian's experiments. Let, let us just kill them and be done with it. Let us just kill him. Cipher its knowledge. <laughs> what use are Nalfarian's twisted experiments to I just us? love that. The laboratory itself is of no consequence. But the molten fire that powers it, that we can use. That is massive the molten fire that powers it what molten fire and why is eridicron so very interested in using that molten fire the only thing i could immediately think of is fire lord the lord of the fire rounds ragnaros now the only reason that would not be possible is ragnaros is dead we killed him twice so we we are well aware that R ragnaros is dead and it's been confirmed that ragnaros is dead could it have been a portion of ragnaros's power though is it possible that nalfarian stole a portion of ragnaros's power and used that to power his laboratory i genuinely don't know what i do know is that if this power source is important to a Ritochron and them, it is almost definitely linked to the elements. The primal incarnates are creatures of the elements. Uh, and one final thing, again, just showcasing the Drakthir and their search for power. They're, again, hiding. Just showcasing these guys are much too powerful for us to fight. We have to hide, but we have to keep an eye on these guys because they're trying to take what belongs to us is of no consequence but the molten fire that powers it that what is we that use keep eyes on them desrin whatever remains of naltharian's legacy belongs to us i just love that it belongs to us again they don't want to defeat the titan uh the aspects or the titans or really necessarily want to kill anyone they just want what they believe is theirs and that is the legacy of nalfarian and of course the primal incarnates they don't think that they deserve it they just want to take it and they think that they're powerful enough to do so i love this final moment with them just flying off and again you still see the mist so you you know that this was moments after Razageth's fall her storm is still fading it's it's still there her presence still lingers for a bit but you know it is sort of opening up and this cinematic really just showcases that they probably weren't in there for as long um as as you might imagine anyways ladies and gentlemen that i think is the analysis if I've missed anything, please let me know in the comment section below. Although I know that you guys are diligent and you will let me know if I missed anything. So I'm really looking forward to reading your comments on this one. As always, I want to give a massive shout out to all of the patrons and the YouTube members that support this channel every single day. I really appreciate all of you. Uh, if you want some uh, access to very naughty WoW hentai, then head over to Patreon all uh, content on patreon is available at only one dollar per month so your support is very very much appreciated and of course we are working up to all manner of other things remember to hit that like button if you enjoyed it hit the subscribe button if you want to see more of this channel 
And as always, ladies and gentlemen, be kind to each other, be good to each other, and I will see all of you in the next one. Peace out, fam.